basic chemistry. So we talked a little bit about this last week when we talked about the inorganic stuff at the beginning. So the subatomic particles. So we have to, we kind of have to start with that. Everybody remember the proton? That's plus. So you see a plus sign and this stays in the nucleus. And then there was the buddy called the neutron, let's spell that right. And that has zero charge. Zero charge, not O. But the really, the one that wants to party, the one we got to talk about is the electron, subatomic particle. You're going to see how the electron, which is negatively charged. You see the polarity here? Positive to negative, those poles. And it creates a lot of, it doesn't repel actually, it, it attracts. So it creates a lot of potential energy. But it's polarized, right? There's a negative pole and a positive pole that creates that energy. So that's inside just every atom, right? So we're gonna talk about those atoms, chon, right? Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. And remember that carbon and hydrogen are really what makes things organic, especially carbon. That's always a question on the first quiz or exam, which element or which atom will make a molecule organic and you're going to say carbon that's what you're going to say so the electron will form bonds with other atoms so these these two are in what's called and don't get confused with the cell i know these two proton and neutron are basically at home in the nucleus of the cell where the electron is out in an outer shell and there's what's called valence electrons in the in the most outer shell and that makes sense because they're the ones that are going to react with other atoms as well. So this is all inorganic chemistry. Remember this molecule? Did you ever hear this? Two H's bound to an O. You've seen this before, right? This is water. So this is not organic, but this is the most abundant inorganic molecule in our body. And let's, why, why screw around? Let's just say what this is. This is, if I asked you, say you, you're walking out of Chipotle today after buying me my burrito, right? And so, somebody comes up to you with a gun and says, what's the most important quality of water, right? So now you're in sympathetic mode. So what do you say? You're gonna say it's polar, polar, yeah, polar, which means it's very reactive with other polar substances that usually are organic like carbohydrate and protein. So the polarity, you might not understand exactly what, what that means right now, besides that polar or two ends of a magnetic field, but why that's important. So what is an inorganic molecule that is very polar, amazingly polar. So then after eating the burrito, probably, and then you had a gun to your head, so you're really not feeling so well, you're gonna release a lot of these in your stomach. These are hydrogen ions. And let me ask you this, please answer. Is this going to like, increase the hydrogen ion? Are we going to have more acid or base? Say it. Say it. Base. Now, this is actually acid. Learn it now. Learn it now. Excellent. Glad you brought that up. This is acid. It doesn't really make sense when you look at the pH scale that an acid is low pH, but below seven, less than seven, not in the blood, but in the laboratory is acid pH percent of hydrogen, which you'll see later. So I'm, so I'm glad I brought that up. Then you might see something like this, like an OH minus, that's called the hydroxyl ion. That's a negatively charged. And you might recall, or you might be gonna learn tonight that a positively charged atom is an ion. And if it's positively charged, it's called a cation. A negatively charged ion or atom is called an anion. So this anion is what gives us base, right? So if I put these two together, you have two H's and an O, what are you gonna get? Water, right? So water is also a universal solvent. I'm not gonna go into everything about water. I just wanted to know what the most important thing was when you had the gun to your head outside Chipotle, in Marstown. So that was, it's polar, okay? So again, these PowerPoints um, through Pearson are kind of repetitive. So, you know, I'm gonna kind of skip, or you know why this matters. I told you already, you can watch the videos. I leave up those animations. All right, we're going to talk mostly about basic chemistry, and then we'll go into the macromolecules and the biochemistry, which is really organic chemistry we're going to talk about. 
organic chemistry, which has carbon, carbon rings. But look, they, they're telling us already, because we're studying physiology, right? So we have to know about movement because movement is a part of life. Digestion is a function of life. Pumping of the heart. Yeah, we, we need chemistry for this. I don't know if you know what that means, but you're going to learn it. And the nervous system, right? Muscles and nerves are very excitable, electrochemical gradient membranes, excitable. And the nervous system is electric, which means it involves a lot of those positive and negative charges. So really important is chemistry. I'm starting to realize that now. Basic chemistry, this is really repetitive, no problem. So matter, what's the matter? That's not what we're saying. The matter is anything that has mass and occupies space like me. So anything that you could, could be weighed and it takes up space in the universe has mass. So those atoms have mass. Remember chon, chon, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen have mass. And mass is coming from mostly from the protons and neutrons, not so much from the electrons. They don't have much mass at all. Yeah, it can be seen. Not really. I mean, you need a specialized microscope to see it, but you could see it. Not with the naked eye, of course. That's gross anatomy. Smelled, maybe, or felt, right? If you close your eyes, maybe you could tell the difference between different matter, right? So we say mass. I'm sorry, I didn't bring that up. Mass is weight, but in the absence of gravity. So when we have gravity, we have what's called weight. So if we're on the earth, we have what we call weight. How much does something weigh? How much do I weigh? But in space with a zero gravity, gravity, it's more about mass. Just terminology, not that important, okay? And the states of matter. Um, and I think you know this, you have solids, liquids, and gas. So you pretty much know that. It's not, I'm not gonna make a big deal out of those things. Energy is really important. And energy has a lot to do with the movement of that electron and going from high energy levels to low energy, energy levels and what's given off, but heat is energy, right? Heat is energy in Fahrenheit and Celsius. So calorie is energy <clears throat> that we either need to, for a reaction to go forward or what comes out of a, a reaction. So energy doesn't have mass, but it involves that polarity. It involves that electrochemical um, distribution between two poles, yeah. So some things take a lot of energy, some things take less. Like think of like if you're building something up, like for example, later on, we're gonna talk about building what's called glycogen. But th think of glycogen as something else you're building like a shed or something. You're gonna take glucose and glucose and glucose, and this can go on, this is, it doesn't end at three, and you could build glycogen which is our storage form of glucose. And you're gonna to have to remember that for later. This is carbohydrate, which we use for energy. Remember I said last time we use glucose for energy. So in order to build this, it's gonna take energy. We're gonna, we're gonna, energy is gonna to have to be added to this in one way or another. We lose water. Water is gonna come out of this in this whole process. So this is dehydration, which you're gonna see. But you need energy. Now, if we go the opposite way, well, glycogen goes to a bunch of glucose. That really uses extra energy and gives off energy, really. It really gives off energy. So energy is released, not the electron, the energy in the form of heat, possibly. Okay. So this one you'd have to add water to. And that's hydrolysis, hydrolysis, because you add water. So that's the chemistry is a little tough that way, but it's a lot of memorization, which I'll take you through. There's a nice animation. I think I watched this a couple of years ago. So kinetic energy, kin kinesis means movement, all right, in motion. So kinetic is action energy. Potential is the stored. Like, you know, when, you, when you're climbing up a, a ladder to or on a high dive, say, for instance, using energy to go up. And when you're up there, you have all that stored energy and then it's released when you go downward into the water 
or when you're going up top of a hill, you have all that potential energy. And then as you're going down the hill, it's kinetic. So kinetic basically is energy in motion. Like ATP, you know this, we talked about this last week, adenosine triphosphate, which is our energy currency in the cell, really is potential energy because without cleaving that ATP, breaking it up using an enzyme called ATPase, and adding some water to hydrolyze it. The energy comes from the phosphate that's cleaved off. So it went from three phosphates to two, adenosine diphosphate plus a high power phosphate. And that's where the energy is given off there. So this is more of the kinetic part of it. This is really potential energy. So we have to make ATP in order to hydrolyze it, to get off energy, to make muscles contract, to make your heart pump to make nerves conduct like cells in your brain, neurons in your brain, to conduct electrical impulses called action potentials. Really important. So energy can be stored or and, and can be released. So we store energy. And we're gonna talk about different ways that uh, nutrients that we use for energy. And we store nutrients like glycogen is a storage form of glucose, really good. So chemical energy, Electrical energy, mechanical energy, radiant energy. You don't really need to know uh, most of this. Because today we're going to talk mostly about chemical energy, right? You don't have to know every bit of this chemistry, but we got to get to the bonding. So mostly talking about chemical energy in this chapter. And with the use of water, with the use of enzymes, which are proteins most of the time. All right. So different, and energy, is, there's a law of energy, right? It's never lost, really. I mean, it's never lost completely. It's saying it's lost as heat from a reaction. But then that lost heat, that lost energy, which your book is not saying, that lost energy is going to use, be used for another reaction. So it's never wasted energy in, you, in your cells. And that's the law of conservation of energy. So here we go. Here's the meat and potatoes now. So elements are just a lot of one atom really and, and all the isotopes you can hear the word isotope and that's important um, to understand that there's different forms of one element not that big deal it's a real straight up definition that i'll give you so they didn't spell it like i did but what are the four elements that make up 96 percent of our body and that's carbon hydrogen oxygen and nitrogen remember this is not molecular oxygen this is um, the element oxygen or the atom oxygen because oxygen gas is a molecule, two oxygens, O2. Okay. So that's really, we're not going to memorize the periodic table. We'll talk about atomic numbers and things like that. And we'll tell you a couple of them. Most likely the ones from Chan are the ones, only ones you really need to know. So atoms make up the same atom, make up the element and it's isotopes. And we'll tell you what the isotope is. So atomic symbol, I think we've, we're pretty clear on that. Like um, again, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. But the other ones that kind of don't make so much sense. Now wake up now, wake up everybody. What is Na? Say it. Sodium. sodium. Beautifully said. So that used to be called natrium. So now they call it sodium. What about this? Potassium. Way to go. Why do we go? We didn't, might not have known that last week. What about this? Iron. You got it. Iron Man. Iron Man. And then we have this one, another important one we're going to talk about. What about this? Come on. You could do it. You could do it. Urban. Calcium? Calcium. Yeah, be careful. Calcium. It's got that little A. Sometimes I, I screw up and I put a big A. You can't do that. It's got to be little lowercase A. Little A. Okay, and you might see something like this magnesium, not too much, not too much. Uh, what about this one? And I got to write a small lowercase mm -hmm. l. Chlorine. That's chlorine, right? Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay, so this is their stable forms, means that everything is stable. You don't have an extra electron floating around, you don't have a lost electron. These are not ions. These are just stable elements also, and atoms if you're just taking one of them. So most of the, like this top row tend to lose electrons. 
So they're going to be what's called cation, positively charged ion, right? And usually this is two lost, and this one too is two lost. And this one too is two lost. And chlorine is the only one negative. I think, I think that's really all we got to worry about. But you could have molecules that are negative. Like remember I showed you before this hydroxyl or hydroxide ion. This is actually a molecule that has an ion. So this is not technically, this is not an element. This is a molecule. You could have, um, of course, you could have hydrogen is a, is a very common one. That's the um, acid. Remember acid, this one's base. OH is, is base or alkaline. And hydrogen ion is always acid. Let me ask you this. Is, I said this last time, see if you remember. Does How many protons does hydrogen have? Or what's its atomic number? Very simple. Think of the lowest number. One. It's just one, yeah. So sometimes the, the atomic number is up here. And it, it just says one. So that means it has one proton. And if it has one pro pro proton, it has one electron. That's the way it goes for everything. The, the thing that changes is the number of neutrons. And you're going to see this in a couple of slides. But when the number of neutron changes, that's called an isotope. And that's why they call it elements. So chlorine is the only one that has a negative charge. You might see, like, uh, like later on, you might see this HCO3 minus. That's an ion, an ion, because it's negative. I'm just putting these brackets because that means concentration. And the concentration of these are very important. So this is called the bicarbonate ion. And it's a mix of, of one carbon, one hydrogen, and three oxygens. And it tends to gain an electron in its ionic form. So this might be another one that's negative. There's a phosphate that could be negative, more negative. A lot of proteins carry negative charge. So you'll see that. So hold on to those atomic symbols because you know those good. Here's Chan again. Yeah, you're not going to have to memorize this. Okay, but it gives you a little bit about them. And you know that oxygen, when it's combined with another oxygen, it's going to be important as a gas, right? O2, right? So carbon, again, makes everything organic. And usually you have hydrogen along with that. And hydrogen, remember the atomic number is only one, and then carbon is six, and oxygen is eight. Those three are very important in organic macromolecules, right? Again, this is just going through more and showing you more. Sulfur and phosphorus as a element, not as an ion, it just looks like a P. So there's chlorine, there's magnesium, iodine, when we talk about um, the thyroid gland, let's talk about iodine, and iron is Fe. So these tables are good just, just to review. Excellent. So the atomic symbols, we got that down. We're good there. And we talked about these, these guys and girls. I don't know which one's guy or girl. So they have weight. The protons and neutrons have some weight. And it's usually about the same weight. One atomic mass unit. It's a very low number. That's why we just say AMU. But virtually nothing. This is a cloud, basically, just floating around, electrons with its negative charge. But that's the one that wants the party, all right? So these atoms have like a planetary model. Like, again, this is not the cell nucleus, but you have the nucleus with the proton and the neutron. Then you could have one shell, and that's where the electrons live. So if this is hydrogen, there's only one electron, and it's in that shell, and that would be hydrogen with the atomic number of one. And it was in, in hydrogen one, you have one neutron and one electron every time. So they call it the orbital model. And we're gonna use what's called the octet rule, right? just to know how many electrons will fit on those shells. Okay, and that's just what they call them. But the, the key is the outermost shell. Like in this case, this is, uh, this could be hydronium, which is, or helium, sorry, this, which has two, atomic number of two, helium is written like this, and the atomic number is two. So this is the atomic number, which gives you the number of protons. So in a stable helium, you have two, and the, I believe the neutrons are red. Sorry, the pro, uh, protons are red. Two protons, it has two neutrons, which are yellow, and two electrons out in the shell. 
So in this case, there's only one shell. And if this was a different element and had more than two electrons, we'd have to go to the next shell. Because know this, this is the nucleus. The first shell outside the nucleus can only hold two electrons. And every shell outside of the first shell can hold up to eight. And that's called the octet rule. So all you have to do is get the atomic number. Then you count, okay, there's, this is carbon. It, it could have six protons, six neutrons in, in its stable form. So the first shell is only gonna hold two. So in, in carbon is six electrons because it matches the number of protons and neutrons not plus each one. So the first shell outside the nucleus will hold two of those electrons and the next shell will hold four if this was carbon. So there'll be four outer shell electrons because we're done using electrons. And the outer shell is also known as the valence shell. And that's the electron, the, the electron, and they even, look at this, they even call the, elect the electrons in the outer shell valence electrons. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the valence electrons or electron are the ones that are ready to party. They're either going to pick up more electrons or they're going to jump off that outer shell, depending on how many are in that shell. Because if there's only one, like in, in hydrogen, hydrogen, you have one proton, one neutron, and in the outer shell, you only have one electron. So the outer shell is the first shell because hydrogen is just one. So this electron tends to jump off. So if that electron jumps off and goes meets up with somebody else and this hydrogen is left alone, it's gonna be a positively charged ion because it lost an electron. So that's a really common one. And that's the one we'll talk about the most, I think. I think that, that and sodium, we talk a lot about sodium. Yeah, for sure. So hydrogen is one proton. And technically no neutrons, but there are different isotopes. Helium is two neutrons and they, they come up with a weight. So you're gonna have to know the atomic number, the mass number, what isotopes are, and you kind of have to sort of have to know what the atomic weight is. I'm probably not gonna use that a lot. Cool. So in this case, this is hydrogen, which really has just one proton and one electron, one shell. But let's go over the lithium because it's a little more interesting because this has three protons and remember the um, electron number usually is the same as the um, proton number. So three protons in the nucleus of lithium. And remember, the, this shows you now that we're going out now. The first shell can only hold two, but the next shell could hold up to eight. So there's only one valence electron, and that's the one in the outer shell of lithium, which is a metal. So here's what you have to know. Atomic number is just the number of protons. And, and, and you, all you have to do is kind of either memorize the four or five atomic numbers, then you can tell me how many protons are in there. That's it. The mass number is the total number of protons and neutrons. You just add them, right? That's all you have to do. So isotopes, here's the thing. Isotopes vary. It's the same element, but the number of neutrons changes right? Like carbon. Carbon is, has an atomic mass of 12, but its atomic number is six, means it has six protons, right? So carbon 14, with the mass number 14, has six protons, but it has eight neutrons. Carbon 12 only has six neutrons. So carbon 14 is an isotope of carbon 12, because it varies in the number of neutrons. Cool. So you, be, you, you don't have to memorize the periodic table, but it's good to know the ones we talk about a lot. Like this is different isotopes of hydrogen because the neutron number changed. Hydrogen one, hydrogen two, and hydrogen three. They have different names too, but we're not gonna get into that. Isotopes are used, and, and I'll tell you right now what they're used for, like radioisotopes are instable. Like the stable forms are the ones you see on the periodic table, the ones we've been talking about and, and the atomic numbers are stable. So radioisotopes are unstable. 
yeah, they are they're un, unstable. They, they become more stable when they decompose, and they decompose very quickly. Right. So we use radioisotopes for things like, um, well, let's talk about this. You guys, are, some of you will be um, radiography people, right? So did you ever hear of like using like a contrast dye to look at something? Like say, uh, say the heart or the brain. So a radioisotope is injected into your blood usually, or you, or you can drink it or you can inhale it if you're trying to look at the lungs and the lung uh, vessels, the lung conducting vessels of the lungs. So the isotope will bind to your either red blood cells or to oxygen within your lungs or into your blood. And when you take an x-ray, you could actually see the radioisotope because it's a thicker, um, it's, it's not, it, it could be metal sometimes, but you can actually see um, an artery, like what an artery, if an artery is blocked, like you take an x-ray and you could see the arteries of the heart, the coronary arteries or the, the blood vessels in the brain. And you can see if, if somebody had a stroke or somebody is at risk for having a heart attack. So we can use radioisotopes for imaging. So that's, that's, at least it has some use there for us. I mean, for us, you know, it has a lot of use for people in chemistry, but. So it has different energies, it has more radioactive. So it can be a little bit damaging too with radioactivity. So again, these are, things that don't last a long time, like carbon lasts forever, but carbon-14 is much easier to break up to a less or more stable form. So it's used for research, it's used in medicine, mostly for imaging. And it also radioactivity itself can be used as like a radiation therapy using that energy from those ions. Molecules, we talked about molecules, right? Molecules, two or more atoms bound together. Like this is a very organic molecule with the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. This is this is glucose. Very organic. We want to use glucose for energy. All right. This is hydrogen gas, and this is oxygen gas. So they're not compound molecules. They're just called molecules. Compound molecules will have different um, elements in them. So just some terminology to get used to. And we're going to talk about this now, the solutions or mixtures, really, like some things that mix well are called solutions, like uh, sugar and water is basically a, an easy thing to mix. Uh, milk is a colloid because it got, you see the cloudiness in it because milk has proteins in it, larger structures that reflect light. So the colloids give you that uh, more colorish appearance, like white milk. Suspensions are... Blood it becomes a suspension because when you when you spin it down after taking it from somebody's veins and you let it sit, it's going to settle into different layers, so like this. This is a suspension of blood. So the heavier things, like the more dense things, like your your red blood cells especially, will will go to the bottom. They're the most dense. They have that hemoglobin in it. There's iron in there, so they basically spin down together. The plasma is the fluid in blood. And this little buffy coat on top is like the white blood cells and platelets. So this is why I want to talk about suspension because it's blood. It's our blood is a suspension. All right, so the particles kind of go downward with their density. Colloid jello is a good, you ever hear of jello, right? I don't think you can get that at Chipotle. But jello is a, is a colloid. Mostly with the sugar in it, though. This is not protein. Milk is protein. So a solution is like water with usually not sugar, but ions, right? Because you have like, did you ever look at a bottle of, of water? Like, um, you look at the ingredients. It, it has, it's not demineralized, not distilled, distilled, sorry, distilled. So it still has like some uh, sodium chloride, magnesium, and sometimes you have fluoride in there too, fluorine which is another negative ion. How do I remember that from so long? I don't know. So the, you can't see the ions because they're microscopic, but you can see the larger things like sugars and protein. And this is a suspension blood. So th that, that's what we need to know that for. I'm not gonna do any experiments on that in lab or anything. Cool. So this is important. This is important because we're gonna move on uh, in a lecture or so and talk about 
the cell membrane and how things kind of go through it and what osmosis is and fusion. So the first thing you should know is a solvent and homogenous means a, a mixture, almost like a clear mixture, evenly distributed throughout. But a solvent is usually the liquid, usually the bulk of what's in that mixture. Like remember the, the bottle of water, most of it is H2O, but then you have solutes in it like sodium, right? Sodium chloride or thicker in colloids, you have glucose, right? Or in blood, you have the blood cells, right? So the solute is usually what's usually in, in lower concentration and smaller, but the solvent is the, usually in our body, it, the universal solvent. Here's another thing, like the guy with the gun, remember in Chipotle, Marstown? If, if the second thing, you say, okay, good enough. You told me what, that's polar. What's the next thing that's really important about water? You're going to say it's the universal solvent. So all these ions, all these important ions that we need for all this stuff, like muscle contraction, nerve conduction, transport through membranes, happens in the medium of water most of the time. Unfortunately, our membrane, the oh, cellular membrane, our plasma membrane, is made mostly of lipid. And I think I might've mentioned last time, lipids and, and water just don't mix. It's not a great thing. So the, so this actual membrane, cellular membrane, plasma membrane has to be selectively permeable about what it lets in as far as these glucose and the, and the sodium, potassium chloride, amino acids, estrogen, insulin doesn't get in the cell, but it it's, has to let the glucose in. So water is the universal solvent. It's always that, of course, liquid, right? And our body's made up of, uh, what I don't even know, 90% water? That can't be that much. It's more like 69% water. And each fluid compartment in our body, like I mentioned last time, is mostly water. Our plasma, our extracellular fluid, our cytosol, what's in the cell. Rock and roll. And there's gas. I, in, in water, like everybody now thinks it's healthy to drink uh, water that has hydrogen gas in it. Maybe, maybe, could be, I don't know. It's probably a trend. I don't care. I'm a Chipotle and I don't want to hear it. But still, they say that hydrogen gas in the water is better for you overall. So these things, gases can be dissolved in water. Now, oxygen, remember oxygen? This is, we, we can't make ATP, you can't live without oxygen. But oxygen isn't very soluble in our blood. It really isn't. Oxygen, uh, we'd have to force it in there. So we, because we carry most of our oxygen inside the red blood cell on a molecule called hemoglobin. CO2 is a lot more soluble than water, probably 20 times more soluble in water. Do you ever drink um, seltzer? You know, seltzer, that bubbly stuff, All right? Anybody? So this, the bubbly things, like in Chipotle has that too. You can get carbonated uh, drinks and seltzer. So the carbonation is CO2. So CO2 dissolves better in water than does oxygen. That's important when you learn about how these gases are carried in your blood. Because we want this stuff to get the hell out. We want this out of our body. We want this in. Because carbon dioxide in excess in our blood is a problem. It creates acid creates a lot of hostile environments for our chemical reactions. That's what we're talking about. Okay, so you don't have to know everything about milligrams per deciliter, but I think this is more important. Like you have the percent concentration and then you have the actual concentration, which is how much like how much um, hemoglobin, how much sodium, how much glucose, if you will. And that's usually, uh, the unit that's used for that is milligrams, milligrams, which is, and a gram is a, is a unit of weight, a very small unit of weight. So this is milligrams is one thousandth of a gram. So it's a lightweight, of course, these little things, although hemoglobin is pretty big compared to sodium. So, and per deciliter of blood, deciliter of blood. Okay, so that's, of course, not all of your blood, but a sample of your blood. So it's kind of, you know, you should know units like talk about beats per minute or so milligrams per deciliter is important for like blood glucose, um, sodiums and potassiums. 
Okay, and you hear the word mole. Mole is like saying like a dozen, just a lot of one compound, right? One, one thing, like a mole of glucose. You don't have to know how to get it. You don't have to know how to um, figure it out. You don't have to know what Avogadro's number is because that's just a, a number that they came up with. Avogadro, of course, came up with it's this number in case you're on Jeopardy and you have to answer that. But a mole is like just a way of saying a lot of one element or a lot of one molecule, like, like a, a mole of glucose. And it's based on how much is in water, you know? So you could have the percent con concentration, you could have the actual concentration and the actual concentration and the, and the amount is moles. So that's important. When I say concentration, you have to know what I mean when I talk about the concentration gradient, when we talk about osmosis, when we talk about cellular membrane transport. Yeah, yeah, we're not gonna talk much about colloids. We, we may talk about emulsifying, uh, but not even this semester, we'll talk about that in um, AMP2. Suspension though, you should know blood is a suspension when it's after it's been spun out. It's a suspension. I think you kind of get the mixture and, and all that stuff, right? So everybody okay? So are you comfortable with at least what an electron is? what a valence electron is. That's, that's the takeaway here. What sodium looks like, and then it can be an, a cation. And it, there's a lot of electrical things that go on, and there's gonna be, I'll show you bonding. I think that's next. And how the electron will either be lost or gained, shared, or there'll just be an electrochemical gradient. So we'll get through this, don't worry. I know this is a, this is a and I think it's important, but again, I'm not gonna kill you with chemistry. I just want to give you the basis. So next, so when we talk about cell transport, you're going to know what I'm talking about. Any questions? Anything? So I'll keep it as, as basic, 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 basic as I can. I can't see this. I think this is the next, where we're going. Professor, I have a quick question though. Absolutely. What's up? So just to, going back to molarity, we will we be doing any questions with molarity? Not really, no. No. No, I got to get to the cell membrane. So... You just have to know what a mole is basically. And, and like I said, it's just an amount of something like a mole of glucose, a mole of sodium, a mole of protein, a mole of hemoglobin. Because it, it, you will hear it again, but again, I'm not gonna test you on molarity or molality, okay? Get it? So if you're taking chemistry, you might learn more of that, but this is not a chemistry class. So again, just the basic chemistry. Now this is gonna be kind of important to know the difference in bonds. We have to get through this, right? The chemical bonds, and there's three major ones. So again, there's reactions between and involves the electrons. These are the ones, these are the ones that wanna form bonds. So again, doing the octet rule, you know, there could be two on the inside and then eight. And all you have to remember is eight up to the up, up to eight to each level after that. And the outer one is called the valence shell or the outermost electron is the valence electron. So that's the one, or it could be multiple that are bonding. So an atom wants to have eight to be stable in its valence shell or it's, it may be more reactive if it has less. So most atoms of course do not have full valence shells of eight. So they're gonna be either shared or lost or gained. So this is neon, right? Neon 10, atomic number of 10, has eight valence electrons. Helium has two valence electrons. So very stable, but inert. And what do we have here? Hydrogen. So here we go. Here we have more, and here's sodium. So now we're talking about something that might be useful for us. So hydrogen has just the one, which we know. Carbon has four valence electrons. So carbon's gonna like to bond with up to four hydrogens, right? To form something like CH4, because hydrogen is more likely to share the electrons with carbon very easily too. Oxygen has the atomic number of eight. So how many valence electrons is that two? and then there's six in the outer shell. So oxygen likes to bond with hydrogen too. And what? And then what would it form if it shared an electron with hydrogen? 
right? It would form water, right? Hydrogen gave that electron and bound with that. Now, so now oxygen's happy because there's eight electrons thanks to the sharing of electrons with hydrogen. Sodium, now the sodium is 11. So that the outer shell of sodium only has one electron. So it's more likely to lose that electron and become an ion. Make sense? And that's, that's important. Again, this is gonna be a little um, repetitive too, but it's all good. So these are the three types of bonds. Ionic bonds, and this is what you should know, this is important. Ionic bonds are where atoms lose or gain electrons. Covalent, now so losing and gaining are the keywords there. Covalent bonds are gonna be sharing electrons or pairs of electrons, sharing electrons. So covalent, know this, is the strongest bond. And this is the bond you're gonna see in the organic molecules. And covalent bonds could be polar or nonpolar covalent. They're still sharing. So polar covalent bonds share electrons unequally. That's where everybody forgets, unequally. And you're gonna see that in water. That's what makes it so polar actually. Unequal sharing of electrons. So one's getting more than the other. Nonpolar is more stable, like between carbon and hydrogen in the organic molecules. Nonpolar share electrons, as you would imagine, equally. Now, hydrogen bonds are important too. This is the weakest bond. So remember, uh, covalent bonds are the strongest, especially the nonpolar covalent are the strongest bonds. Ionic bonds are the next strongest, but the weakest bond is hydrogen bond because it's kind of designed to be broken in some areas. So it's the weakest bond. And nobody's, there's no sharing, there's no losing and gaining. This is just an attraction, we'll say. I think that's the best way to ex explain it. Attraction of what? Of positive to negative, depending on the um, molecule. So let's, let's look at water. This is always a good one. Water looks like this. You got the big oxygen, right? And it's bound to two hydrogens. Hydrogens are the smaller circles here, right? Kind of like a, a teddy bear ear or, or this is like a bug. So oxygen tends to be more electronegative and hydrogen tends to be more electropositive, remember, because it's pretty much given its, it's not giving, but it's electron is basically part of oxygen now. So this bond, now this is one water, water molecule, that's two H's, H2 and O. This bond, this is really important. This bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen is a polar covalent bond. because the oxygen tends to hold all the electrons. Hydrogen is just basically a proton. And this one too is a polar covalent bond. Now say we have another molecule of oxygen, like, I'm sorry, of water, big oxygen, water. Remember, the oxygen is more electronegative, the hydrogen is more electropositive. And then you can have another molecule. You've got tons of these things, right? They're all over the place. Hydrogen, hydrogen, this is more electronegative towards the oxygen, more electropositive. So you're going to have bonds between two different water molecules. I'm drawing dotted lines because these dotted lines are going to represent the hydrogen bonds. 
So basically, the hydrogen bonds hold big molecules together. Like water is not that big, but you'll hear about things like uh, polypeptide chains, which are very long proteins, really. And the shape of those molecules are held, held together by hydrogen bonds, like DNA. You've heard of DNA, deoxyribose nucleic acid. DNA is, is double-stranded, so it has two strands that are held together by hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds hold large structures together. So that's, that's where we need to live on these bonds. So these are really important. So the hydrogen bonds technically doesn't do anything with the electron except be attracted to it. Cool. So ionic bonds are the lost and the gain. So you should kind of memorize that because that'll help you with it, right? The number of protons, of course, does not equal the number of electrons. It's more giving and taking. So if you lose an electron, that means you're going to be an anion, which is a negatively charged ion, like chloride. Now, some proteins, like proteins inside your blood, you'll we'll learn about this again. It's all, it's all building up to the plasma membrane and transport. That's a tough topic. So chloride is mostly negative, sorry. So a lot of proteins carry a negative charge, like proteins inside your cell are negatively charged. And we can call them a protein anion because it's negative. So uh, something who loses an electron is called a cation. So that's more like sodium. Remember sodium only had that one electron in its valence shell. Now chloride is, only, is gonna have seven electrons in its valence shell. And we don't have to go beyond eight. We can stay there. We don't have to go to 18 or anything like that. We're gonna stay in these lower numbers because we're talking mostly about chon, C-H-O-N. So it, it, there's an attraction and an ionic bond is a salt bond between sodium and chloride. They bond very well together, form the salt. So it's a, it's a strong bond, but not as strong as a covalent bond, which is sharing, remember? Covalent bond means sharing. Ionic is losing or gaining, really important. So chloride here has seven valence electrons, chlorine, and the outer shell has seven, so it tends to gain an electron. Now, electrons are negatively charged. So if sodium chloride is dispersed, you're going to be, have a negative chloride and a positive sodium. And that's where we get those ions from, and especially when they're dispersed in the solvent of water. So sodium and chloride become solutes in the water mixture. Yes, right? And here's sodium chloride. If you have separate the two. Again, you're not gonna have to draw this anywhere. You just have to know why they're negative and positive ions and know what a cation is and an, and an anion. So when dried out without water, they're little salts. Like you throw it on the ice outside or put it on your, on your burrito bowl, if you will. I think there's plenty of salt. I don't think we need to do that here at Chipotle. This is a crystallized salt and this is how it bonds. It forms a nice tight bond. We could break it up kind of easy, especially with water, right? We hydrolyze it, but it forms a nice lattice of, of strength. Now, and to tell you the truth, we're not gonna talk a lot about uh, bonds, uh, ionic bonds, except for when it comes to these two. So this is, comes up a lot in a &P. So here we are covalent, right? Nonpolar and polar. Polar, of course, is that water molecule right between the hydrogen and the oxygen, not between water molecules. That's a hydrogen bond. So you're sharing one or two or more. So, of course, sharing is two electrons. Right? And you could have double bonds where you're sharing two pairs of electrons, which is four electrons, or a triple bond with three. So, like, I think nitrogen is a triple bond. It looks like this. It's bound like this. And that equals nitrogen gas. Right? O2 is oxygen double bonded to oxygen. So that would be oxygen gas because it's sharing uh, two pairs of electrons. Yes, four electrons. So there's two types, polar and nonpolar. And the polar ones are really important for in the water molecule. Okay, this is showing methane. This is, is, is clear because carbon has that six uh, electrons and it's easy to share with one hydrogen, two hydrogen, three hydrogen, four hydrogens to make up this CH4. 
and that's methane gas. That's a classic example of a covalent bond, strong bond right there. So here's oxygen. Okay, that's a double bond. So oxygen has an atomic number of eight. So you have the six valence electrons and it's easy to share these two pairs, four total electrons and have that O2 gas. Covalent bond, that's the key, that's the takeaway. Nitrogen triple bond, here you go, like I showed you before. Sharing three pairs of electrons or six electrons because nitrogen in its outer shell has the one, two, three, four, five. It needs three more. So it shares it with another nitrogen to form nitrogen gas. So nonpolar, this is where you get some, and kind of confusing, um, just with the terminology. Nonpolar is equal sharing of electrons and results in, in nonpolar molecules like carbon dioxide is nonpolar. So all the macromolecules are polar, which we're gonna see. Okay, so this is an example. Carbon dioxide is a good example actually of a nonpolar covalent bond where all electrons are shared because it's covalent equally. Polar covalent bonds, now this is a little different. Now you have unequal sharing of electrons between two atoms. So it becomes polar, like more negativity on one side, more, I guess, positivity on the other. So like oxygen and water would be more electro negative where the hydrogen little thing would be more electropositive like i said before so this is a polar covalent bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen and we'll talk more about hydrogen bonds they're really important so polar covalent bonds water of course h2o is a polar molecule remember okay and it has a dipole which just means the two poles negative and positive, positive hydrogen, <clears throat> negative oxygen. So it's a partially negative charge. So you can see how later on, you're gonna see the, uh, how hydrogen bonds work. And here's water, like I like to draw this upside down because it looks more like a teddy bear. So this little delta here is, is showing the, the positivity and the negativity. Here it is, shown in, in letters. So this V shape, like that's slightly bent like that. So, and, and uh, not only is it because of the electronegativity, but oxygen is a lot bigger technically than hydrogen. Everything's a lot bigger than uh, hydrogen. So it also carries more electronegativity. Okay. So again, just comparing the three. This is a nice table, tells you what, what's going on. Loss and gain, unequal sharing, equal sharing. Very good, and it gives you examples. This is really good, so you should remember this. H2O, polar covalent bond. I remember where, again, we're not talking about hydrogen bonds here yet. Just kind of brought it up. So this is that attraction. It's more of an attraction, like I said, than it is a sharing or losing. And that's exactly what it is between one part of a molecule and between molecules too. It's weak, it's more of a magnetic attraction. Technically it's not a true uh, attraction or true bond and it gives it gives it more quality to to the water and what makes it a liquid like where it has tension like again we we can't walk on water right maybe natalie or somebody can walk on water but i can't walk on water most of us can there was one guy that could do it but he's that's two thousand years ago but a bug can walk on water like if somebody something without a lot of mass because water has a surface tension and that's important for our bodies that water has that surface tension. Sometimes there's too much, but these hydrogen bonds is what creates that. Like water's, you know, again, like like this morning, here's a good animation here, by the way. Like this morning, I'm, I'm you know, making my uh, oatmeal, right? So, you know, you have to boil water. I, I learned that I do that a long time ago. So it takes a lot of heat energy to, to go from that liquid form of water to, to vaporizing it. That's a lot, I, I don't even know, maybe 300 degrees or more on the stove. So water really will hold on to that energy to hold on to that heat until it's had enough. It has a boiling point, 212 degrees, whatever it is. All right, so it depends how fast I can get that thing going. 
but 212 degrees is the boiling point. So water has a very high heat capacity. And just, and just to make it go up in your body, one degree is, takes a lot. The water could, you know, it takes a lot of heat to, to make your body temperature go up one degree. So you're like, if your temperature is 98.6, of course, we gotta get that checked all the time. And if it goes to 99, okay, that, that's not so good. It's not bad, but if it goes over 100, that's an issue, right? It's only a couple of degrees, but it makes a big difference in your biochemistry of your blood. Right, something's going. Something is wrong. So it's really important the the qualities of water. And water holds on to a lot of heat. So like when you, when it's really hot out, like on a really hot day, you know where do you go? You go to the beach, right? Where it's it's cooler because there's more water there, and hopefully there's a breeze too. Sometimes there's not, but just being near water takes the heat down because the water, especially the ocean, is absorbing a lot of that that heat within and especially because of these this polarity and this bonding uh, hydrogen bonding so i can't say hydrogen bonds are useless because they're not they're, they're weak but they're very important especially holding things together like dna or hemoglobin molecules or other protein enzymes that have to have a very very specific shape so hydrogen bonds keep these molecules together and give them a shape like water so so valerie could walk on her water when she's walking across the pond so here is the dotted lines between water molecules. You should get to know this is what a water molecule, molecule looks like. Big oxygen, two little rabbit. Now this looks like a teddy bear, right? Now it looks like what I would draw. So the hydrogen bonds are between the oxygen and the hydrogens all the way around. It doesn't matter how many water molecules are in this mixture or the solution, they're all gonna be bound together by hydrogen bonds. So the, the thing to know, the oxygen hydrogen within the molecule of water is held together by a polar covalent bond, but the bond between water molecules is more of an attraction and it's called a hydrogen bond. Big deal. Big, hey, there's the bug. There's Natalie or Valerie or one of the Anthony's walking on water, right? It's because it has high surface tension. So water is really important in our bodies. That's why it's the universal solvent. Yep. So chemical reactions, we're going to talk mostly about the organic molecule chemical reactions. You know, we're not going to do every chemical reaction. We get to the cell membrane, you have to understand what um, isotonic, what hypertonic and hypotonic means and diffusion and osmosis, what all that means. So you have to kind of understand the chemistry a bit. And again, I don't want to kill you, but we're spending tonight. Let's get it out of the way and then we can move on to more fun stuff. This is fun for me, but I don't know about for you, but it's all important. Okay, so the products is kind of like math, like you add things in and you get a product. So substance is entering a reaction and then you have a product like ADP or reactant, so to speak, plus a phosphate equals the product of ATP in a way. That's kind of a, not the greatest example, but it, it makes sense, right? This denison diphosphate, two phosphates, plus one phosphate equal a denison triphosphate, which is three phosphates. And they could go both ways. That's why it's kind of like a balanced equation. I should draw a line like this instead of an equal sign. Because it's a reversible reaction, which a lot of them are reversible reactions. I talked about glycogen and glucose. That's a reversible reaction. And here's the formulas. I think we I think we got this down. The H2O and this remember this is glucose. Usually a two to one ratio, hydrogen to carbon. And carbohydrates have a lot of oxygen too. CHO. In fact, I used to always just this was like a shorthand for if I saw this written in a book or something, I would know that refers to carbohydrate. That's how important all these three elements are in a carbohydrate. So glucose is a carbohydrate, which you're going to learn exactly why that's a carbohydrate. And that, that gets a little bit better. So this is a reactant just building molecules. We're just building molecules like two hydrogens equals, they can go both ways, draw a reversible reaction. Methane, same thing. Okay, so these are the reactants. This is the product just to understand basically what's going on in this reaction. Now, this is important here too, I like this because this is showing a chemical reaction that's anabolic. OK, 
Okay, so A plus B equals AB. So let's say, let's, I guess we all stay with car carbohydrates. Let's say we get A is glucose, glucose, which is a monosaccharide, plus fructose. And I'm not going to draw the whole thing because I, that would take too long. Fructose is another monosaccharide. If you put, add those two reactants together, you get what's called sucrose. And sucrose is a disaccharide. And basically this is table sugar. So if I walk over in Chipotle and I get like a, a Pepsi, not Pepsi Zero or Coke Zero, I have to get the one with the sugar in it. You get a whole bunch of sucrose, which is a disaccharide. So the product was sucrose. And again, this could be reversible. We could break sucrose down by using an enzyme like sucrase. And we have that enzyme in our small intestine. It's gonna break it down, soup the di disaccharide to fructose and glucose. But we're talking about anabolic. We're talking about synthesis. So going in this direction from the two monosaccharides to the disaccharide is anabolic. If we were gonna go the other way, sucrose to the glucose and fructose, that would be catabolic, which you're gonna see. So AB would go to A and B, separated. Synthesis reaction, now this they're using amino acids. So if you add all amino acids together, like if you, and, and my rule with proteins is if you have 50 or more like greater than or equal to 50 amino acids equals a protein. So if it's less than 50 amino acids, I call that a polypeptide, just some terminology. Okay, so going from amino acids, say we take, I don't know how many are there in that picture, but you take amino acids, you put them together, different amino acids too. There's 20 amino acids that we could build proteins with. And, you, and you're building a protein out of that. So let's just say protein. So this could have been 50 or more. That's anabolic. That's synthesis, right? Now I'm gonna give you a little, little hint. This is important. Every time we build up something anabolically through a synthesis reaction, you're gonna lose a water. So most anabolic processes, like especially with these organic molecules is called a dehydration synthesis because you're losing a water. I don't make this shit up, it's crazy. Okay, so, but it makes sense, right? If you hear synthesis, right? It's always dehydration synthesis, right? You're gonna find that the other, the other way when it lyses, like hydrolysis is the opposite, but synthesis is always anabolic. It's always building up anabolic, like making disaccharides from monosaccharides or making polysaccharides from monosaccharides, making proteins from amino acids, making triglycerides from many fatty acids. It all rocks that way. Now decomposition is catabolic. So again, we, we're taking the, um, let's use another one. Let's use lactose. Lactose is a di disaccharide. So we need an enzyme called lactase to break that down, but we also need water. So decomposition is catabolic, breaking it down. And this is gonna involve more hydrolysis. So we're gonna add water. Lysis means to break up. So to break up lactose, we add water plus an enzyme called lactase, and you're gonna get glucose, which we should know by now is a monosaccharide carbohydrate, plus another monosaccharide called galactose. So that's catabolic. We're catabolizing, we're decomposing lactose. I don't know, decomposing sounds morbid though. I like hydrolysis better. So remember, dehydration synthesis would be the other direction. We lose a water, but in this case, we're adding a water plus water. So dehydration synthesis versus hydrolysis. You gotta kind of remember that. This is good because this is important. You know, glycogen is our animal. We're animals, we're mammals, right? So we store glucose in the form of this polysaccharide 
called glycogen. So when we do the macromolecules, this will be very easy. But later, especially later on when you guys are really tired and all the Anthony's are like sleeping. And I'm only left for one Anthony. And then we'll, of course we're recording, but you know, this might, okay, I remember I was talking about glycogen, right? So glycogen is broken down, it's hydrolyzed. It's catabolized into monosaccharides of glucose. And this is the stuff that rolls around in our blood. This is our blood glucose or blood sugar. And your blood sugar should be between 90 and 110 milligrams per deciliter of blood. That's what a milligrams per deciliter gives you a concentration. And you can do percent based on 100 milliliters of water, or you can do the exact amount in moles. But this is their homeostatic range that we like to talk about in anatomy and physiology, not going into molality and molarity. And I will mention that when we talk about uh, diffusion and osmosis and concentration gradient. So if we went the other way, if we built up the glycogen, that would be anabolic. And that's dehydration synthesis, going from monosaccharides saccharides or monomers, we call them in general, to polymers, a polysaccharide like glucose. And we store glycogen, we store this in our liver and our skeletal muscles, because just in case we need glucose to get into our blood to make it homeostatic. So there is a reason we study these, these chemical reactions. And as I might've mentioned this last time, but metabolism. The definition of metabolism is the sum of all chemical reactions. So that means you put all the anabolic and catabolic reactions together, you get an average or a sum, and that's your metabolism of a cell. I'm not talking about your BMR, your basal meta metabolic rate. I'm talking about cellular metabolism, part of life, right? Metabolism, quality of life. This is exchange, means we can exchange different things. Um, Maybe one time in this semester, we're gonna talk about how things kind of mix and match in a reaction. I'm not gonna talk about that too much. Maybe, maybe that might just be today too. So, so here's a classic exchange reaction here, <laughs> but talking about glucose and phosphate, ATP and glucose, of course. Denison triphosphate, it's kind of what then ATP looks like. Remember ATP, right? We'll talk about this later a bit, but ATP falls under the macro organic molecule of nucleic acid because it has an atrogenous base. It has a sugar, which is ribose and three phosphates, right? So again, we're never going to see this reaction. I mean, this is biochemistry, like when you're doing the Krebs cycle and, and glycolysis, and, and we're not going to do this, but just to show you that some of the reactants can be exchanged to form different products and back and forth that can go. But I, th I think you're getting used to this. I think you've seen everything, right? Right, this is, this is kind of important though too, because this is cellular metabolism. And again, you don't have to know what oxidation and reduction reactions or redox reactions are, but it's all about moving and losing electrons and gaining electrons and giving energy out of those going from one energy level to another. So glucose plus oxygen is, and this is basically cellular metabolism, is going to give you ATP, right? That's how we make ATP. We need glucose, we need oxygen in the mitochondria. But the products of this cellular respiration, because it's oxygen and carbon dioxide, you're going to give off a lot of carbon dioxide. It's kind of a waste product, carbon dioxide. So we got to get that out of the body. You give off water too. H2O, and this is really what we're looking for because you need ATP to run your cell cellular cycles, muscle contraction, nerve conduction, all of those things. So some reactions will, will give off energy. And usually this, maybe you should remember this, the catabolic reactions, the hydrolysis reactions are exergonic, means they give off energy. And we can use that energy for something else because energy is neither lost or gained, it's always reused. Endergonic means we have to put energy into the reaction 
to let it go. So it needs energy, like especially anabolic reactions like making sucrose or making lactose or making proteins from the smaller particles, which is anabolic dehydration synthesis. So if you put all those together, energy, right? So theoretically, all of these are reversible. That, that's kind of important. You know, we can reverse the reactions. The big ones, like I mentioned, building carbohydrates, polysaccharides, building proteins, building nucleic acids, building lipids. Because the macromolecules are really kind of important. This is important too, because we, we didn't get to these things called enzymes yet, but chemical reactions should happen in a timely fashion. So things that are important are temperature, right? Temperature has to be homeostatic. And usually the higher the temperature, homeostatically, not, I'm not talking about fever, uh, the, the, in a laboratory, increased temperature. Like, you know, like if, if you're making tea, you know, the hotter the water, the, the better the tea will diffuse into the water out of the bag. You know, you, you need that temperature to increase to make that reaction and diffusion happen. And reactions, anabolic and catabolic as well. The concentration is how much of the reactants we have. What's the concentration? What's the percent? Okay, what's the molality, if you like? Like how much are in that actual 100 milliliters of water? But it's all the same thing. It's how much, it's a concentration gradient. Like later on, we're gonna talk, especially next time, when I put brackets around something, it's saying the concentration of say sodium. So the concentration of um, sodium is high outside the cell, but inside the cell, the concentration of sodium is low. Or potassium, like outside the cell, the concentration of potassium is low, but inside the cell, the concentration of potassium is high. So when I put brackets around, it's the concentration gradient. And it's based on how much percent, it's based on molality, and it's based on how much of that actually is in that particular amount of water, generally. It's usually fluid, yep. So the smaller the particles, the faster they move, like ions move faster than glucose. Um, glucose moves faster than insulin. And it depends on the size of it. So temperature, concentration, and particle size, very important. And the catalysts are basically enzymes. Now enzymes speed up reactions. And, and one thing you should know about enzymes, and you'll see this later, that they're proteins. Most of the time, they're proteins, okay? And enzymes speed up a chemical reaction, but they do it by this, this is important. They catalyze, speed up a reaction. They do this by lowering the energy it takes for a reaction to go forward. So they call it the energy of activation or activation energy. So technically the enzymes in a reaction, they don't go in there and, and bust things up right away. <clears throat> they, they just lower the energy it takes to activate a reaction and therefore it speeds it up. So you need enzymes. If you don't have enzymes, things are gonna could take something that could take uh, 0.2 seconds could take 24 hours. That's how important enzymes are. And it, enzymes are protein, so they have to be homeost in a homeostatic environment. The proper body temperature, <coughs> the proper pH, or else proteins are going to break, break apart. They're going to denature, which you're going to see later on. Everybody okay? Emily, you with us? Any yeah. questions? How you doing, Chelsea? You good? Yes, I'm good. I'm still here. A lot of stuff, huh? A lot of stuff. It is. <laughs> trying to get through, trying to get through to give you the most important thing so we could, you know, get into the the more fun stuff, if there is any fun stuff coming today. But next time, it would be better when we talk about the cell. Let's just do a little bit more of one before I know we're here a long time. Let's see what's next. This is what? This is three. That's the last thing we'll do. Let's do something else. I only see four of them. Let's see. Acid base, we'll go to next. There we go. Let's do that. We kind of talked about that already.
So this should be bad. I'm going to take a break after this. Okay, so again, acid base now. And the pH, percent hydrogen of blood should be 7.4. I know there's a range, but this is slightly alkaline. Anything below 7.4 in the blood is considered acid. Anything above 7.4 in the blood is considered base or alkaline, same thing. Okay, so we'll talk about acids and base and then we'll on to organic compounds after the break. And we'll talk a little bit about water first because water is where these acids and bases disperse. So 60 to 80% of the cells is, is water. I mean, these numbers every time, it's always like in this range or higher for your fluid compartments to have that percent of water. So now, Again, the guy with the, with the gun at Chipotle, we already talked about this right here. It's polar and it's the universal solvent. And I mentioned it has a high heat capacity, right? It holds a lot of heat, takes in a lot of heat before it raises one degree in temperature. And it has a high heat of vaporization. So it takes a lot of energy to boil that water or change its form or freeze it for that matter in the opposite direction. Reactivity is very important because it acts as the it's part of being a solvent. You know, reactivity. And we'll talk about something called osmosis when we go to the cell membrane. Osmosis is movement of water, diffusion, just to give you the definition, is the diffusion of water. It means the movement down its gradient from high concentration of water to low. That's really all that means. So when you hear osmosis, think water. That's why I brought it up here. So that's part of the reactivity, yes. But also the water with the, with the free hydrogens and the, the polarity and being the universal solvent as for a lot of reactions to happen, so reactivity. Cushioning is more physical cushioning. When you think about like the, you're gonna hear about this stuff called cerebrospinal fluid, which surrounds the brain and spinal cord. It's a fluid. It contains mostly water, 80% water. And it basically protects the brain within the cranium and protects the spinal cord within the vertebral column. So cushioning is really important throughout the body. So high heat capacity, a big ability to absorb and release heat. Remember um, the first day last week, we talked about how and the feedback mechanisms when we're really hot will sweat or lose water to control the temp temperature change, right? And of course, you're not going to lose water if you're going to sweat if you're going to, you know, be Love cold. You. Yes? Question? Love you. Me too. Love you too. High heat of vaporization, right? That's evaporation. It requires large amounts, right? When I'm boiling my water for my... Um, Oatmeal, right? So that's another important quality. So if the guy's still holding you up at Chipotle, you tell him what's other things, high heat capacity, high heat of vaporization, polar, solvent, universal solvent, right? Dissolves things like solutes, ions or solutes. Good hydration, of course. And of course, this is here's a good one too. It's a major transport medium, like in the blood, Again, 80% water again. The plasma is water. It's a medium for moving things around. So again, if you look at this as like a salt cube, I think a salt cube. You ever seen those? A salt cube. So the salt and the sodium and chloride in the salt is the solute. The liquid part at this point, and assuming this is in a lab with distilled water, is the solvent. So the liquid and whatever there's more of is usually the solvent. That's going to be important when you do the cell membrane as well. Reactivity. So all these reactions, remember hydrolysis is catabolic. Dehydration synthesis is anabolic. Adding water, losing water. Hydrolysis, you add a water. Dehydration, you obviously lose because dehydration. Try to keep those in mind when we're doing the organic macromolecules. Cushioning, physical trauma, right? Like CSF, cerebrospinal fluid for protection. 
Okay, salts, I think we've talked about ions, right? But now we're going to talk about these two because we're not including these aren't salts. These are the acid, right, and base. And basically that's what it is. One's positive, one's negative. Electrolytes. Um, I think it's important, you know, just that these are all electrolytes, sodium. But these are ions, too. The ion version, not just the sodium. Right? Electrolytes are breakdown of uh, catabolic salts. So sodium, potassium, calcium, iron, all electrolytes, magnesium too, fluoride. But these are these are the important. I think this is a really good um, sentence here list because these are the ones we really need to know. And I just got to throw chloride in there too. It's the only negative one. But these are salts. Now, again, something like this we're going to find in bone tissue. Like this is the, the salts that make up the mineralized part of the bone. And there's phosphate as well. So the bone has phosphate and calcium. But we'll talk about that when we get to the bone. So here's the acids and bases. Um, again, when it's dissociated in water, they're going to split to the hydrogen ion and the hydroxide hydroxide ion. So this is base, remember. This is acid. Okay, so proton donors are your hydrogen ions. It's all they really are are protons because they have no electrons. If they lose that one electron, they basically become a proton, right? So this is a very strong acid. HCl is hydrochloric acid. So it disperses into many of these and drive that pH down. And the only place you really see hydrochloric acid is in the stomach because we need hydrochloric acid to help the enzyme to break down proteins, which happens in the stomach. Yeah, very important. So we're going to have to talk about buffers in a minute, but carbonic acid, of course, is going to be a weak acid that's going to act as a buffer. And you'll see that in a minute. So this is just talking about sodium hydroxide. I don't think you really need to know about this. You should know this though. This is called hydroxyl ion. This one you need to know too. This is bicarbonate. So this is a buffer in our blood. This is what buffers acid, all right? Like you ever have an acid stomach, right? You go to Chipotle and you have, uh, my stomach's really bothering me. I have acid stomach. What are you gonna go buy to try to help you feel better like what's an antacid like what's one like name an antacid like tums maybe tum to dum tum tums is a bicarbonate that you take to buffer the acid so acid plus the then this is the bicarbonate ion right here this is the bicarbonate that's the buffer is going to pick up that hydrogen and it's going to turn it into carbonic acid So now this becomes a weak acid, which could break up and, and actually go the other way to hydrogen ions if our blood becomes too alkaline. So this is carbonic acid. This is the bicarbonate ion. This is a buffer, buffer, and it buffers the acid by lowering this. So that's basically what you're taking when you take tum to dum tum to lower your acid in your stomach. So here's the pH scale. And this is kind of confusing because it's kind of an inverse logarithm. You know what I'm saying? Like it's a, they call it a negative log logarithm because it's negative numbers. So pH stands for the percent of hydrogen written with an uppercase H. So on a scale of zero, seven in the middle, this is in the laboratory, not the blood completely, and 14, less than seven, like all in here is acid because it's a negative scale. These are negative numbers. Really, this should be, this is really 10 to the minus seven, right? This is 10 to the minus 14. This is 10 to the zero, just 10. So that's a lot of hydrogen ion. A lot of hydrogen ion on the left of this picture. So that's why it's inverse. But you just don't, you don't have to worry about that. You just know that less than seven between zero and zero is the most acidic on the pH scale. 
whereas 14 is the most basic or most alkaline, same thing. If you could remember that, and that's also called base. So in the laboratory, seven is, is a neutral pH. But where did I say we need the blood? Blood pH, anybody remember? 7.4. 7.4. Now you may hear like there's a, there's a range like 7.35 to 7.45. That's if, if you have compensation, like the two organ systems that pretty much control pH in your body is the lungs, this respiratory system, and the urinary system, the kidney. So if I have a blood pH that's below seven, and it's because of my respiratory system where I can't get rid of the carbon dioxide, then my kidney has to kind of help out by reabsorbing more bicarbonate ion, not peeing it out. So you don't have to know that exactly right now because that's pretty complicated, but you should know that the two systems have to work within this range, but you still, if, if my pH of my blood is 7.39, that's acidosis. You know, it's in range because it's compensated because, you know, my, my kidneys and my lungs are working together to keep that hydrogen low in my blood, but you don't, it doesn't cure the condition. So if, if your pH is fluctuating outside of the 7.4, I mean, something is wrong. Either you're alkaline, either you're in acidosis or you're in alkalosis. So this is where the blood is. And this is the compensatory range. So technically a textbook will tell you the homeostatic range for pH in our blood is 7.35 to 7.45. Now urine, urine could be anywhere from um, I would say six to eight pH. That's a big jump. When you jump one uh, pH number, that's a huge jump. It's like 16 times really. And this is, depends on your diet. Depends if you're, you know, eating a lot of red meat and, and if you're going to Chipotle every night like me, you, your, your urine is going to be a bit acidic, which is fine. And, and, and probably it's normally more acidic. In fact, this could, it could go down as four and that's still within range, to tell you the truth. But if I'm a vegan, if I just eat, you know, the, nothing but vegetables and uh, no animal products, then you're gonna have your pH is gonna be, be a little bit higher than seven, not a little bit, that's significantly higher. One point is significant. No problem though, body's good with that. I mean, this is urine though, by the way, this is not blood. So this is fine. Having a pH of urine at this level is no damage to you. It's perfect, actually. It's, it's fine. As long as it's within this range, I would say four to eight. So the average is like six. So most urine counts are, are acidic. Yeah. And there is some reason for that. Like naturally the urine will acidify more um, because it's antibacterial in the urinary tract. So it's okay to be acid too. It's, it's got a reason to be acid, right? So the acidic pH range, again, is this right here. This is laboratory though, not the blood. So please understand that like the neutral pH in the lab is seven. But again, we live at that pH. So please know what these, this all means in the numbers. It's, it's just kind of memorization. This is kind of cool because it shows you what products that we eat like, uh, you know, of course, we don't drink hydrochloric acid because dead you'd be. We use that's battery acid. But, the, but, but listen to this. We have HCl in our stomach. Isn't that crazy? Lemon juice. Look how low that pH is too. It's very acidic. Is it bad for you? No, not technically it's not. It's not going right into your blood and changing your blood because your body buffers it pretty easily and you, you know, your digestive system takes care of that. Uh, this is like grape wine, I guess, red grapes. Uh, up to 3.5. You can't buy that at Chipotle. That's too bad. Black coffee, you know, without milk, I guess the pH is lower without the milk. Five. So these are big jumps actually going up towards neutral. So your blood is 7.4 and milk is uh, slightly acidic. Right? Slightly acidic. pH of, of the albumin, the protein in, in the eggs, the egg white is slightly basic. Bleach, very alkaline, um, ammonia, NH3, 
And a lot of the cleaners, right? A lot of the, the strong chemicals are more basic. Lye, like we use for soap, is also um, alkaline. And uh, they, they use it for straightening hair out in salons. So sodium hydroxide is a pH of 14, extremely basic. And please, this is something that's just in a laboratory. Okay, and we neutralize things. This is a nice neutral reaction. Here's an acid, right? HCl, anything with an H like this, bound like that, is gonna be acidic. Sodium hydroxide is the OH, that's more the opposite. That's, you know, that's the basic alkaline. So together, those two reactants will have water, of course. You see the, this OH and the H will give you the water and then you'll form a salt with the sodium chloride with the ionic bond, right? Sh losing and gaining. Ionic, I like to, let's just call it ionic salt. So your body's dealing with these things. Your stomach's dealing with it. Your pancreas likes to use a lot of base and buffering to, because the, the small intestine um, is the first part of the digestive system after the stomach. So the stomach's very acidic. So everything that's coming out of the stomach, you wanna make sure it is buffered before it goes any further. So the pancreas will release some sodium hydroxide and make the, the food that's going down there that's called chyme actually become more neutral and easier to absorb and, and better for the blood. Okay. So here's this, this is kind of important for now. We're, we're gonna revisit this in AP2 with the respiratory system. But again, here's your buffers. Like this is the weak acid, carbonic acid, right? And this is the carbonic acid bicarbonate system. This can go both ways. So this is your bicarbonate ion right here. It's a weak base, so it'll take on that hydrogen ion, buffer it, to this weak acid. And this can go another way too. So the carbonic acid bicarbonate system is our buffering system to lower the acid, especially. I mean, it, most of the time where you're, the problems are in acidosis, like ketoacidosis we'll talk about. But again, alkaline, you don't want alkaline, that's just as hostile. But more, more, than, more than likely our body's more worried about becoming too acidic or have been in a state of acidosis. Okay? So we'll talk about enzymes too later on, but enzymes control, an enzyme, there's an enzyme called the um, carbonic anhydrase. I don't know if it was on that page. Like this system uses an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. ASC at the end there. So that's the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction. And it goes both ways. You see the water, you know, the H2O in both sides. Okay. Patients with a cardio a pH, an arterial pH of seven during cardiopulmonary resuscitation means it's too acidic. That's, that's, it's, that's way out of range, okay? And somebody with pH this low in blood is deadly. So basically that's what, what we're saying. So you guys okay? Everybody doing well? Chemistry is tough. Chemistry is probably the toughest thing we do in the A&P here at um, CCM, right? There's the atlas. See the atlas right there. So anybody have any questions or anything before we move on? Maybe we could finish this up today, this chemistry thing quickly. And uh, then we could forget about it for a while, except for the exam, of course. So anybody have any questions or anything? What time is it? About 8, 12, 8, 11. Okay, so let's come back at um, 8.35, is that okay? Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, it gives you a chance to get something to eat, or, you know, and you know, take a break, because this, is, this is gets really, this is a lecture that's really, you know, drags on. So I'll try to get you through it as quickly as I can. And uh, record, you know, we stop this recording.